This is the sound of people on purpose neglecting the heroic and positive side of their own history. To many outsiders, the following will sound very marginal and of merely academic interest. But this tale of two memorials for several months have been the story in Croatia, creating the most attention and seeing most citizens and politicians commenting with the most emotions. Among other things, threatening the life of the government and new snap elections. That events more than seven decades old are so important to Croatian society is telling for how difficult it is for Croats to come to terms with their past. But as shown by the huge attention given the theme by other ex-Yugoslavs, the story is about them as well. We are in the memorial park built to the memory of Yugoslavia's World War II anti-fascist partisan movement in the Bosnian town of Mostar. The park was designed by celebrated Serbian architect Bogdan Bogdanovic and opened in September 1965 by Yugoslavia's president Josip Broz Tito. The partisan cemetery contains more than 600 gravestones to partisans who died fighting the fascists. These and other sculpture-like stones are placed on six terraces on a mountainside with a view on most of the ancient town at the green Neretva river. In Yugoslav times, the cemetery became a symbol of the town of Mostar as well as of the Yugoslav anti-fascist struggle. Here were held official commemorations, families came on excursions and loving couples met at night. But since the breakup of Yugoslavia, the partisans and everything else Yugoslav have been loathed by official Croatia and by political representatives of ethnic Croats here in neighboring Bosnia. This goes for the southern town of Mosta as well. Here, since the war in the 90s, around half the population is ethnic Croat. Unfortunately for the memorial park, it finds itself in the Croat half of town. This means that it's left to vandals and has been so for 25 years. Therefore, the famous memorial park has become meeting spot for alcoholics and drug addicts. The monuments have been broken or disgraced. There are Nazi symbols and other fascist graffiti, broken bottles and needles. Oil at some point was poured over the suppressors planted to make the area stand out from the surroundings and they were satellite. The monument is covered with garbage, broken glass and at best weeds and underbrush. The state of Vostas famous memorial park is mirrored by the state of memorials to partisans and other anti-fascists across Croatian inhabited areas of the former Yugoslavia. 3,000 of such statues and other monuments have been blown up or pulled down in Croatia alone since the 90s. At the same time, thousands of streets, parks, squares and public buildings have been renamed. After in Yugoslav times, having carried the names of partisans or other anti-fascists, Many were named after leading Ustasha. The Ustasha were the Croatian fascists during World War II, when Nazi Germany in April 1941 attacked and occupied the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, they proclaimed their own state. This so-called independent state of Croatia, NDH for short, in the four years to 1945, murdered at least a couple of hundred thousand people, most of them Serbs but also Roma Jews and political opponents. In 1945, Nazi Germany was defeated and with it the NDH and the Ustasha. But when Croatia in the 90s fought an independence war to secede from Yugoslavia, the Ustasha ideology re-emerged. 
Today's relatively small group of Ustasha sympathizers have a large influence because mainstream politicians are afraid of turning the country's patriots against themselves. This was made in particular clear when a group of veterans from the independence war last December put up a plaque to commemorate some of their fellow fighters. The plaque ended with the salute Sadom Spremni, meaning for the homeland ready. This was the Ustasch's official greeting, corresponding to the German Sie Keil. The plaque with this greeting was placed in the town where the Ustasch's largest concentration camp had been during World War II and where at least 80,000 people were killed. Now, would it be possible for anyone to put a plaque outside the Dachau concentration camp in Germany, for example, with the greeting Sieg Heil? No way. But in Croatia, this plaque with its fascist greeting stayed at the KZ camp for nine months. Then an ethnic Serbian party and another liberal political party threatened the government with withdrawing their support in parliament if the greeting wasn't removed and the plague was taken down. But it was put up again a few kilometers away where it now hangs near the graves of partisans who died fighting the Ustasha. All this shows that Croats have a highly ambivalent relationship to their past more precisely, that they don't agree about it. Many abhor the Croatian Sikhail, but many others have a weakness for it. There's a similar disagreement about the other side of the coin. While the Ustasche slogan represents fascism, certain street signs in the capital Zagreb ever since World War II have represented anti-fascism. And it's no coincidence that these street signs were taken down in September. Here we are at Marshall Tito Square in Zagreb. The square was the Croatian capital's largest and most beautiful and was named after partisan leader and later socialist Yugoslavia's lifetime president Josip Broz Tito in 1946. As part of breaking with Yugoslavia, many Croats wanted Tito Square renamed already in 1991. This would have matched what happened all over the country, as well as how the Memorial Park in Mostar was treated. But the newly independent Croatia's president said no. Franjo Tutman was a nationalist and had led the war for independence, and he sympathized with the Ustasha state. Apparently not for what it did, but because it was Croatian. But he realized that after World War II without Tito, there would have been no Croatian state today. During World War II, the Ustasha had compromised the idea of independent Croatia, and Croatia as an entity only survived as part of anti-fascist and socialist Yugoslavia. Therefore, Tito retained his square in Zagreb, until the 1st of September 2017, when the city council decided to rename the square after the Republic of Croatia. The reason that this happens exactly now is that the extreme right with 10% of the vote in the local elections held in June became kingmakers. Without their votes, the longtime mayor couldn't keep his job. And the extreme right, who sympathize with the fascist Ustasha, had just one demand to support the mayor, that Tito's square was renamed. To outsiders, this may seem odd, as Tito is a world brand in a positive sense. He's famous for being the only man who defeated both Hitler and Stalin, 
the latter by refusing to follow the Soviet kind of socialism and instead choosing a third way between East and West. It's also well known that Tito earned Yugoslavia influence and respect the world over. He made traditionally enemy-like ethnic groups work peacefully together in Yugoslavia, gave everyone a job, made everyone fairly well off, made them fairly free, gave them free health insurance and education, and so on. But the official argument for renaming the square in Zagreb is that Tito was one of the ten largest mass murderers in history, as one mainstream politician argued. This is a huge exaggeration, but it's true that tens of thousands of people after World War II were executed without trial because of their role during the war and that Tito, as the country's president in principle, was responsible for this. It's also true that Yugoslavia was a one-party state and thus by definition undemocratic. All of this, however, has been known for decades, but there's good reason that Tito is wiped off the Zagreb map just now. It's in the air, so to speak, the current Croatian air. It's the same atmosphere in which the Ustasha, defeated by Tito and his partisans in World War II, that the Ustasha have a revival. It's the atmosphere in which the fascist slogan was allowed to stay next to the concentration camp where inmates were killed to the sound of that very slogan. This is what it sounds like, for your homeland ready. The guy shouting it is a member of the national football team and he finds himself in the national stadium in Zagreb where Croatia in November 2013 has just beaten Iceland and secured a place at the World Championships in Brazil. Imagine a German footballer shouting Sieg! and then being answered by tens of thousands of unwatchers from the stands, Heil! That could never have taken place. But in Croatia it was broadcast on national TV and only after an international outcry there were any official reaction. It's the same with the plague with that same Ustasha slogan. To mainstream Croatia it's a sign of patriotism. On the other hand, Tito, who led the fight against the very same Ustasha, should be removed and forgotten as a shameful part of history. Just like his partisans at the cemetery in Mostar, they defeated the Ustasha, but merely in life. In death, they are now the defeated. To outsiders, all this with Ustasha and Tito and plagues and street signs and fascists and anti-fascists may sound very marginal and passé. The thing is, these two stories about the plague with the fascist greeting and about Tito's square in Zagreb for several months have been these stories in Croatian media creating the most attention and seeing most citizens and politicians commenting most emotionally. Among Croats, apparently, the past has come to stay. <laughs>